Oh yes, this is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. Today's show is sponsored by Ringmaster on a mission to launch B2B podcasts that create relationships, generate revenue, and drive growth. Ringmasterlive.com. Bam. go the train has left the station i've got the coffee i've got the energy drink i'm literally caffeinated up i am ready to go and i'm going to need it for this interview today for this conversation because we have an absolute brilliant guest today she is a total badass who is she casey marketing leader and thought leader head of brand we're going to talk a lot about brand we're going to talk a lot about marketing all sorts of good stuff today she's a board member an advisor a mentor um, she works with fintechs and SaaS startups. She's a mentor for First Round Capital's Fast Track program, founder council member, um, founders council member, head of brand, work management at Atlassian. Sarah Emmett, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Man, there's just you're just doing so much. I almost lost myself completely in your introduction. <laughs> it's funny you say that. I had um, a fellow working mom kind of point the same thing out. She's like, I don't understand how you're doing this all. And I was like, it's the 80-20 rule. Give everything 80%, not 100, and then you can get a lot more in. Well, it's working. And I, but I think your 80% is everyone else's 100%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to pass you this. It's heavy for me, but I think you got it. Ugh. Okay, go ahead. Sweet Take game. Thor's hammer, grab it. You gonna grab got it. it. You go. Oh, wow. Oh, One-handed <laughs> grab, ladies and gentlemen. This, this is fantastic. Confidence. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, you just you just took Thor's hammer like a tennis racket. You're just like, let's go. So take oh, Thor's huh. hammer and yeah. <laughs> right? Smash for me some kind of marketing myth, a bogus strategy, misconception. Set the record straight once and for all. Awesome. So this is one that has been really top of mind for me recently um, over the last six months. And it is the myth that uh, creators and community and influencers are ancillary and a nice to have, not a need to have. And that's completely bogus. It needs to be at the like very center of your marketing strategy from here on out. And paid ads, in my opinion, are quite frankly dead. Uh, and if they're not completely dead, they should uh, certainly take a very back, back, back seat to your community, content creators, and influencer strategy and marketing dollars. Community, content creators influencers should be at the center, but we've got it reversed. Why are things so reversed? Why do we have it backwards? Yeah. So I'll kind of unpack how I came to this conclusion um, based on our own data sets at Atlassian. So looking at one of our core products, so Atlassian's three core products are Jira, Confluence, and Trello. One of our core products, Confluence, uh, we operate across all of them on a flywheel model. So you sign up for free, um, then you're introduced to more products and we upsell you. Uh, but it's very much an organic based on word of mouth, based on the marketing flywheel approach. And in looking at those free signups for one of our core products, Confluence, there was a stark difference between the quality of signups that came in from paid ads versus the quality of signups that came in from organic content, video content from our creators, influencer program. It was astounding. I mean, it was like 11x the quality of these signups versus our paid ads. So like pause right there, take that in. And if you are operating on a flywheel model, this is critical to understand where your best quality you know, signups are coming from. What are your best customers and where what channels are they being brought in from? And it's not paid ads anymore. So in looking at the data set and understanding why, I kind of bucket it into three different standout areas. Changes in tech, changes in trust, and changes in media consumption. So changes in tech. Um, a year ago, or a year and change, there was a major change in iOS privacy, which damn near rendered paid ads ineffective and influencer marketing highly effective. So you add that with changes in Google, who have also started to optimize for user-generated content. So they're looking for those authentic voices. They're looking for those who are actually using your product and using your brand and what they're saying about it. And they're optimizing for serving you that content. Right. 
And then you think about these two kind of changes within Apple and within Google, and then you marry it with trust. So trust is you know, quantified in many different ways, but I think Edelman's trust barometer does it year over year the best of how people are trusting brands and TLDR, they don't. People don't trust <laughs> brands anymore. <laughs> they don't trust big corporations. They don't trust the government. You know, they don't trust uh, what you say about yourself. They trust what other people say about you. So there's huge changes in trust. So they're ignoring your branded communications and they want to hear from your actual users. They want to hear from your actual advocates. They want to hear from those who can stand up and, you know, really put their name behind your brand. So not just celebrities. I mean, it's micro-influencers. It's, you know, your own executives and what they're saying about, you know, thought-leading pieces and changes within their industry. So that trust component is big. And then you think about the third big bucket, which is changing media habits. So um, think about our parents' generation. They're opening up the newspaper in the morning. That's how they're consuming their news. Um, they're listening to the radio. Uh, that's not our reality anymore. What do you do when you wake up? Um, sadly, most of us look at our smartphone. Uh, we scroll the news through social media channels. So you're looking at your LinkedIn and you're getting the content, you're getting your news served to you that way for your industry. You're not opening up the newspaper and reading about it. Um, so when you think about those change in media habits and then the paid ads that are being uh, served on those new you know, changing media, people have ad blockers. Um, anyone who's like Gen right. Z and below is like, absolutely not. I, I know what you're doing. They're savvy. People know what we're being marketed to now. And they, right. they don't, they want, they don't want it, you know? I've paid um, for YouTube Red since it's been like, and you know what? That 12 bucks a month is 100% worth it. And so when I see friends watch a, an ad on YouTube, I'm like, are you kidding me? I, totally. I, I can't sit yeah. 30 seconds through this bullshit. Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah. Absolutely. And and it's and it's only going to increase generation over generation. So yeah. um, being ahead of it now and realizing that, people not only have those ad blockers, but they just don't believe what brands have to say anymore right. um, is I think at the crux of why you see what we saw, which is our paid ads, we're getting shitty signups <laughs> and our authentic user-generated content. So that's the creators who are talking about your product for you and talking about how it works and putting out an awesome YouTube tutorial is what's going to drive that great signup of somebody who's bought in and believes the product and wants to truly try it out and is that much more willing to pay for it. So that's the other part of it. The um, the lifetime value for those that came in from either a micro-influencer that they were bought in. So don't think like a Kim Kardashian. Think like a micro-influencer for that particular uh, industry um, who has a thought-leading voice and is serving out really rich content. Those that came in that way, so micro-influencer or a creator um, who is creating content for us and already had a great following. Um, and obviously, these are both like SEO rich sources of content as well. Um, and the community that you are, you know, helping to serve, their word of mouth is hugely impactful. So if you're getting signups in from those sources versus a paid ad, it's just phenomenally more valuable for their lifetime within the company and as a customer. And just to be quite honest, uh, to to further the flywheel approach. Um, and it's something that I think everyone should look at more closely uh, right now with tighter budgets overall within marketing. Okay. I just want to say, case closed, the prosecution rests. I have never heard a more th thorough destruction of paid ads in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> that was fantastic. And if I was selling paid ads right now, I would be like, check, please. I need you know to get what? into Here's a different the, industry. Totally. Here's like the complication though. So when you're at a large company, what's easier? To flesh out a bunch of paid ads and, you know, get that quick CPE and it's cheap totally. and it's, you know, it might not bring in the quality, but it's more cost effective. It's tough making really great content. It's not easy, right. you know, right. to really have 
the great creators out there. You got to do your research. You got to figure out who those authentic voices are and who's best on a YouTube and who's best, you know, writing your LinkedIn posts and really shouting your praises. Who has the best following? Are they paying for their followers? You know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So it's not an easy, you know, uh, flip of the switch, but it's worth it. And to be quite honest, if I was at a smaller company, that's where I would be optimizing my spend. That's what I'd be looking at first within my marketing budget. When you're at a larger company, it becomes more complicated. And, you know, sometimes you do uh, need to still include paid ads. Right. And I, I totally see what you're getting at because big corporation, all right, well, let's go spend 100 K this month, you know, or more and just bring in some, bring in some traffic, bring in some leads and then just blame it on sales when they don't convert that <laughs> terrible quality. Throw it over the fence. It's their problem yeah. now. Totally. <laughs> right. Well, you guys couldn't close it. I mean, we brought them. Well, yeah. you couldn't close that terrible quality lead. Somebody just wanted the free iPad. Jeez. I can't imagine why. Um, but 11, 11 X, you said it was 11 X better quality when it yep. came in from this other direction, from community, from influencers. From from really rich content created by that community, created by our micro influencers uh, who had awesome curated following. So like for Atlassian, it's project collaboration software. So there's a ton of thought leaders on project collaboration. Those should be the people creating content for you because they already have buy-in. They already have an audience who wants to learn more about these types of products. They already have a curated following. Um, so yes, 11 X, it was pretty astounding. And then also just video video is a really popped as well. People now want to consume video content and it's more the go-to than written, you know, going back to the newspaper, uh, analogy, it's just not how people consume media. So the third bucket around changing media habits is YouTube's the second largest search engine in the world. I mean, Google owns it, but it is the second largest search it's engine in the world. second and first, right? Like, <laughs> totally. brilliant. Right. Yeah. Fair, fair. However, if that's, if that is the reality where we're living in and as such, it's always going to pop up. So if you have a really strong YouTube presence so people can learn about your products and learn about your brand and see, you know, not only what the uh, content is being created by those creators and influencers and your own community. What's the vibe? I remember going through a huge uh, YouTube turnaround when I was at Square because it, when I started there, it was just a catch-all and was not the brand look and feel that you want. So really having ownership over YouTube in a way that when you put that creator content on it, when you link out to your influencer uh, content creation, and when you have your community voices on it, it has a curated uh system to it. So it's easy to digest. So you understand, you know, what is the look and feel of the brand? Um, I would encourage anyone to look at squares. I, I guess we don't have a before and after, but if you look at squares now, it's great. And it's, it, it helps really emulate what the brand is about. It's about the authentic voices, it's about the sellers, it's about their own community. Um, but it looks good. It is not just a dumping ground. So you can't treat it as such if you want it to work for you. Let's talk more about that because I get the sense that some people were probably feeling good when you mentioned video. So they're like, yeah, I got YouTube. I probably dump a lot of videos on there, but what does it mean to curate it? And then talk also more about that shift to more of the voices of the influencer and less about your own voice kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So to kind of anchor it, um, it is a Jeff Bezos quote that I have thoroughly bought into for a few you know, years now. Um, and it is, your brand is not what you say about yourself. It's what others say about you when you're not in the room. And it is so true. Um, you know, and so it's not the branded communications of what you're putting out in your own campaigns. It's what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. So if you stop and think about that and think about harnessing your user-generated voices, so those content creators who are talking about you whether or not you like it and start harnessing them and using them in a way that helps create positive momentum and helps create positive sentiment across all of your channels, then you've like harnessed a huge uh, leverage within your community and within like your marketing levers overall to work for you and not against you. Um, but then the way you put it on your YouTube needs to have 
a very, you know, digestible format. So um, let's say, for example, with Atlassian, uh, there's beginners starting on the products, there's intermediate, and then there's super tailored experiences if you're really building out a complex um, collaboration product or project, excuse me. Um, and then we also have them by industry. So if it's for marketers or if it's for HR, and you want to have that same tailored experience on your YouTube, you want to be able to go to it and say, okay, I know how to navigate through this to get the best out of this channel and have it not, like you said, be a dumping ground where it's people are like, okay, where do I go to? It needs to be this. We yeah. put the same attention to it as you would with a user journey on your website. So what's your website? There's a branded look and feel. Um, there's a, you know, key messages. There's journeys, uh, you know, built into it so that yeah. you're leading people down the path and it should be treated the same way. Dang. This is so good. Uh, real quick, you mentioned flywheel a couple of times. What does that mean to you in terms of marketing? Uh, number one, it means word of mouth. So for flywheel to work, you need to have strong community, strong word of mouth and positive sentiment around your brand because you are not relying on sales and you're not relying on uh, that you know more sophisticated handheld motion to really get people uh, into your product and using it. You are relying on there being enough strength in the product. So oftentimes the flywheel approach works best for product-led growth companies and models. So Square was that way, Atlassian's that way. Um, you need to be able to just get in the product and have an awesome experience right away and then share it and talk about it and say, this is why you should sign up for free. Um, so flywheel to work, word of mouth, positive sentiment, strong brand presence. Um, and so what's funny about that is oftentimes with product-led growth, people think, oh, marketing is you know a very small percentage of your dollars overall, which is true. You're spending more of your dollars in uh, research and development and in building the product itself. However, within those marketing dollars, having that brand be super strong is critical because otherwise, let's say there's um, a crisis in the product, like there's an outage or you know, there's just been a huge malfunction of some sort. If you don't have strong voices out in the community still singing your praises, your positive sentiment on social is going to plummet. And then people aren't going to want to try it because then when they go to look and research about you, they'll see all this negative sentiment. You know, They had a huge outage, tech is down, don't try them you need to still have a strong brand presence in using those user-generated voices, the community, the creators. So your volume of content about all the positive stuff that you've done and all the positive uh, attributes of your product are out there. So when crisis hits, you still have a really great volume to like counter it. Um, yeah. If you don't have that volume, when crisis hits, you're going to stay in the negative for your sentiment for a year, year and a half. Ouch. It can't happen. It's bad. Yeah, but it happens. And, I mean, what happens when negative sentiment is there for a year? Nothing good, right? I mean. Your growth slows. Your right. your flywheel slows. I mean, because you don't have that positive word of mouth. So right. that's kind of why I'm like being a strong advocate for that volume of positive sentiment with your brand advocates in the market on all channels at all times, especially in content creation. So you have that volume out there is critical, even in a product led growth company, because that way, when crisis hits your brand dollars and the marketing voices that you have out there with the community and even your own employees, your employees should for sure be making content for you. You know, mm -hmm. then your volume is up. And so you've spent your dollars well so that when crisis hits, um, you're still operating, you know, in the, in the positive and not, you know, trying to w dig your way out of a dig negative crisis. Out. What's the best way to empower these micro creators, these influencers, micro influencers, like to make content for you? Yeah. Um, you know, right now, uh, Elastian just started its first creators program, which I'm really proud of. Um, and to be, you know, quite transparent, it's a scratch my back, I scratch yours. You know, they are very much also trying to build their following, their presence, their thought leadership, uh, stature within the community, within a certain space, within for us, it's, you know, tech and product collaboration for Square. It's, you know, within different industries. So you would have 
a micro influencer within retail who really wanted to be seen as a thought leader in in that particular sector. Um, and we give the tools, we give a brand guide, we give um, you know some some structure towards like different attributes and talking points that we want, really want to hit home. We give them you know how to use the new features that are being released or you know uh, talking points around how the business can change should you use X product. Jeez. But that's it. Yeah. I mean, you give them a foundation, but the reason that it actually cuts through the noise and the reason that it works better than paid ads is because it's their own voice. I mean, I've seen creators take kind of, you know, the playbook and when they make it their own and they build out a totally different use case and say, this is how I did a marketing campaign using Trello and Confluence together. And I, as a marketer, haven't even used it that way. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Like publish on all channels, you know, because it, it <laughs> is, they've, they've put their own ingenuity to it. They've put their own uh, power behind it. They've actually been a user generated content source because they thought of something completely new. So we give them, like I said, the foundation and the playbook, but they 100% make it their own. And that's why the most authentic and kind of, like I said, noise cutting content comes out because it's stuff that I didn't even think of. Jeez, I love the idea of that. Just they're surprising you with these cool things they found and they're, man, that, that is, I can see why it's so much more powerful to listen to as well, because sometimes a corporate voice, oh, blah, blah, blah. But they were like, oh, look at this exciting person just taking this tool that looks so straightforward and they've made it this masterful like weapon. This is really exciting. Yeah, it really is. And it's inspiring too. So like, let's say you're a newbie into a product you're trying out Trello for the first time and you're confused how to use it with Confluence. And then you see these examples and then you're inspired to like learn more and 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 really like go through the hoops to, to figure it out. Um, but if I were the brand telling you that through, you know, a, a paid video that just has, you know, animation, yeah, not as inspiring. Oh, plus this is the best part. They're real yeah, people. Yeah. You can talk with them. You can reach out to them on LinkedIn. You can talk to them on their YouTube. Like YouTube's so conversational yeah, now. It's a two-way conversation. You know, like that's, I think, the power um, and real difference that I should have highlighted earlier with using community creators and influencers is a two-way conversation. And so if you're like, hey, I didn't get what you did, uh, you know, at like, you know, minute four of this video. Can you tell me more? Great. They're in there. They're responding because they want to keep building their presence and they want to keep being seen as somebody who's a resource. So they're doing so much more for a brand than just a branded communications can do alone. I mean, it's hard to even quantify how awesome that is, except we know it's at least 11x more awesome than anything else around. Uh, totally. Yeah. Derek, who are you? How do you know all these things? Take me back in time. Little Sarah days. Did you know growing up that you're going to be an absolute badass in the marketing world, brands and creators and communities and all these things? Uh, no, but I would say the creativity um, part of me has been um, something kind of brought out early. My my grandmother, who um, helped take care of us when we were little, um, was a actual artist. Um, so she oh, cool. did watercolor and pastel. Um and would make that very much a part of our after school activities. So we had extra art. Um, that's what she loved to do. And so she's like, we're sitting down, we're doing it. Um, and so it became something that not only I naturally liked, but I uh, valued really early on. And I think, you know, one of the biggest crises in our education system now is stripping things like art and music and um, the arts overall from being part of our core curriculum because it is so critical to have that right brain. Uh, developed and it makes you a better business person because this is, you know, such a hot topic now. Uh, AI cannot be as creative as human. And that right. is what I think is going to be the most exciting part of this next, you know, future of marketing is not what AI can do and how it changes, but what it's going to push us as humans to do. I think we're going to see a phenomenal phase of creativity. And, you know, what I hope is even more like a renaissance type of uh, inspiration and push for all of us. I think we've gotten real lazy in what we're producing and the creative, the creative that I see often now from B2B brands is like, let's be honest, pretty stale and easy to just pass over. Super I think we're going to see yeah. some really exciting stuff because we're going to be pushed to do so. We're going to be pushed to stand out 
and be more creative. So little Sarah, um, yeah, very much liked being creative. I think where that kind of got married with what you're seeing now, um, is, uh, growing up in a house with a lawyer, um, and thinking that was also part of my path. I did, uh, undergrad is pre-law. Um, so, I went and worked in law firms to figure out if I wanted to go to law school. I quickly figured out I did not, <laughs> but I still think kind of that, that, that rigor and appreciation for doing your homework, doing your due diligence, uh, pulling things apart and figuring out like, what is the reasoning behind them? And what's the data set behind it? So it's just not marketing for marketing's sake or, or you know, yeah. like I said, just lobbying onto an influencer because anyone else is doing it. I'm doing it because that's what the data is telling me is the most impactful. If it were the reverse, I'd be doing that because you, you need yeah. to rely on actually what's working and what's meeting your objectives and what's moving the needle. So I think that rigor of, um, you know, kind of legal expertise of pulling things apart and being, you know, really diligent and then marrying it with creativity. Um, is kind of what you get today. And then hopefully somewhat of it with a sense of humor. Yeah. And so, and so now you're at Atlassian, you've been in a lot of really cool companies and this continues and you're head of brand, you're in work management. I mean, talk to me about what, what are you excited about? Your is the creators and YouTube, but what, what projects are you most excited about right now at Atlassian? Yeah, I'm most excited about um, our shift to really putting community at the first. So we've had a huge community, um, and obviously I've probably dropped that name or the word community like 50 times in this podcast, um, <laughs> but we've had it for a while. But now really starting to harness it and use it for our brand-led efforts I think is so critical, and I'm, I'm so excited about it. Um, and it's something that Square did for a really long time, so I'm excited to bring over kind of the way that we attacked brand at Square, and I shouldn't say attack, the way that we brought to life brand at Square um, and, and doing so with Atlassian. So um, for Square, using those you know customer voices and the sellers is what we call them, those who um, use the Square products in their retail operations and online, um, in all of our brand marketing communications was, was always at the foreground. Um, so you would see them in the videos, you would see them on splashy billboards, and then you would see them, um, you know, using our YouTube. So taking that over here um, and focusing on community first, I think is is what I'm most excited about. And it's bringing forth that like Jeff Bezos quote. Yeah. I guess he gets a few things right these days, huh? Mr. A Bezos. few things. He's it's got a few things well, going gonna on. She's going to be in the news directly. for something terrible now, and I'm going to want to like swallow the fact that I was quoting him. <laughs> we'll edit it out. We'll be like, that was a quote by a famous entrepreneur. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. We still get it. We still get Amazon Prime shipped in a day. It's it's magic. Um, man. Okay. So you're doing that same kind of, I mean, because you, you were running marketing there too at Square. So it was like the idea of bringing that experience now to Alassian and, but man, customer voices, you can't, can't fake that. Right. Like, uh, yeah. do you, do you find that there's anything, is it actually okay that the quality isn't so high or do a lot of the creators just, they have that high quality as well on the recording side? No, that's a, that's a great call out. That's why it's hard because the quality isn't always there. You have yeah. to give a playbook. You have to work with them. You have to make sure you have voices that, um, are speaking at the right pace and hitting the right high notes and have the right following. It's not, it's not simple. And that's why, uh, you know, paid ads are an easy turn on approach because the creators and the community and creating that user generated content that's going to be super effective doesn't happen on its own. So it's more handheld. What we're getting to now is a more systemized way of doing it so we can scale. Yeah. Um, and Microsoft has like, you know, hit it out of the park with that. I mean, they're, they've completely scaled all of their creators, um, community and influencers. We're, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. Um, but that's why it's not as easy because you do have to have uh, that layer of uh, involvement and sophistication before just publishing their content. That's that balance. Uh, but I, I, I do I do get the sense that you know, I've seen a lot of larger organizations lowering their quality to try to match more of the lower quality of the influencers who are trying to raise their quality. So it's interesting. Influencers are trying to look better. And then the corporations are like, ah, let's look a little bit more human here. So it's a, it's a weird balance they're trying to 
It's like a seesaw. Yeah. yeah, that's a fair call out. Um, you know, so I'll say, see, uh, Upwork has been doing it well with like the right balance between their community um, and their like big okay. brand campaign around uh, changing the way we work now. Um, and Melissa Waters at their CMO spoke about that recently in Ad Week. Um, and to be fair, I did not lead uh, marketing at Square. Lauren Weinberg is the CMO there, and she's terrific. So Good I need point. to make sure Good that point. we uh, we we call that out correctly. And she too. Pardon? I just gave you a field promotion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, she too, I think, did a really nice balance of having uh, the great polished look for the brand and using those those faces of the community and of the sellers in it. And then matching it with the community voices their own, which are not going to be um, as as polished. So you're right; it is a balance, um, and it's interesting to see some trying to play up and some trying to play down. Um, mm. But I think the important part about community is that it's not as polished. Otherwise, people aren't going to be bought in, and then we're back to square one of them being seen as pol as paid ads, and then it's all wash. Right. Right. Huh. Well, my next question is a bit of a hypothetical question, if you're ready for it. Go for it. Okay. I may or may not have a time machine here in New Hampshire. So let's say next time you're in Boston, you come visit, get some lobster, get some beer, hang out in the time machine, right? Now, it's a particular kind of time machine, though, because it goes back in time and you get to visit yourself four days after graduating with that come pre-law degree. What do you tell yourself? You can have a conversation with yourself. You can tell yourself anything you want. What kind of things would you tell yourself? Um, I would tell myself to make sure you know your values going into any endeavor. I think that it's really important. And I think that right now, um, especially post-COVID, most uh, working parents have taken a real close look at that and you know, part of the reason that you've seen attrition for certain companies is because they want the balance more than they had before, more than the generation before. Um, and so I think even at an early age, knowing your values prior to having a family would have been important too. the values of having space and time to travel, um, the value of having space and time to dedicate to philanthropic and nonprofit efforts and really giving back to the community. I think that if you set out saying like, I want to be volunteering X amount of hours each month because that is important to me. You will do it. Um, but if you don't honestly take the time to, to write that down and put it as part of your uh, thinking and planning going into each job and each phase of life, um, it gets away from you. And then all of a sudden you're like, shoot, I haven't traveled in a year. I feel really dead inside. <laughs> or shoot, yeah. I haven't given back in a long time. Um, I don't feel good about the example that I'm showing my kids about, you know, not volunteering. But if you write it down, you have those values, whatever they are, you know, maybe it's not a value for you. But let's say um, getting outdoors uh, once a week is, then then just make that part of your overall ethos and lifestyle and think about it when you go into any job. I mean, I've turned down places before because I have really dug into it and I'm like, this is going to be a, a thousand percent all the time. Uh, I'm going to have to be on my phone while trying to serve my kids dinner. Not for me. And I think a lot of parents know it's not for them, you know? And so if you know that going into a place, you'll pick the right organizations. Atlassian is one of them for sure. Um, so I think that doing that exercise early post-college uh, is, is a great way to then build out the life you want. Yeah. Choosing those values ahead of time, not stumbling in and realizing, oh, this one violates three or four of my values. Uh-oh, what am I going to do? But getting that in, in advance would just save save you so much heartache, heartache and, and heartache. Yeah. stress and all that. Yeah, man. Um, but I didn't wow. do that early, and I don't think most of us do. You just get out of college, you're like, I know. time to work, um, you know? And yeah, so like, let's do this. You're like, wow, these people are really weird. They're like different values in everything that I believe in. This is yeah. crazy. And they never leave the office. Yikes. Right. Right. Jeez. Or they leave the office all the time you know, or, or they don't. Yeah. Just whatever, whatever fits you. What have you, have you found time to continue the art? Has that been one of the values throughout your life or does it kind of ebb and flow as family and business, you know? Yeah. 
Um, I would say it's probably a ladder. It ebbs and flows um, with the online business, but I think uh, there was a call out that um, the CMO of Instagram, uh, Laura Jones, uh, mentioned in one of her um, speeches around finding two for ones. And I think it is also kind of important when you look at your values, you find ways to do two for one within your time. So a way for me to spend time with my kids and fill the art fulfillment is to volunteer in their classrooms. And I went through the um, motions of learning how to be a docent. So you actually teach the art lessons, which by the way, is not easy. You think, oh, okay, I'm just going to go in there and slap some paint on a piece of paper. Absolutely not. You need to learn about the artist. You need to learn about the techniques. You need to really, I mean, luckily I went through AP art, so I have some of that. I just need to right. reach back in the back of my brain for like, it. Holy crap, I'm using this. <laughs> totally, I am using it. Like you're never going to use calculus again, but you could use AP art again. 100%. <laughs> totally. Um, so finding that two for one. So then I get time A, volunteering, because otherwise they don't have art in the classroom. So I'm, I'm feeling good about that for all of the kids. Two, I'm with my own kid or part of it. And three, I'm doing, you know, art, which I find really fulfilling. And I'm I'm letting that creativity out and I'm helping others appreciate it and understand its value. Um, so that's a two for one. And I think that uh, being able to do that um, now more and more through my life is something I've realized is, is the best way to kind of maximize your time, your values, and uh, for me, bring back that art. I've never really thought about that idea of the two for one. It makes total sense, right? That that way it's not like either or, oh, family or this thing that I'm passionate about work or this thing that I'm passionate about or family. It's finding ways to to do both at the same time. That's that's brilliant. Have you have you uh, have you ever had to bust anyone as a docent? You know, had like a Thomas Crown affair thing where they're trying to steal a painting? <laughs> yeah. Uh no, that's hilarious. Um I, I mean, I guess kids do sometimes are envious of each other's artwork, but luckily they have not tried to steal each other's artwork. Um, it's it's <laughs> fun too. I mean, because you 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 get to be with other volunteers, so you kind of want to be giving back as well. Um, and oh, uh, cool. yeah, which is great. So there's um, the one in particular for our school district is called Art in Action, and it's a national organization um, for public schools where Art in Action. Uh, creates these lessons, creates everything that you need to understand and become a docent. Um, and so it's, it's very organized right. and kind of, yeah, it's, it's a great way to, to make it happen across the nation, especially as, like I said, arts are being stripped from public schools and that's a real tragedy. It really is. I mean, we need time. We need to be able to, and people sometimes think it's cheesy, like, Oh, we just painted this macaroni and we stuck it to a piece of paper or, you know, but, but we all those different experimenting with those different kind of things as kids exposes you to like I did paper mache one time and painted it and that was interesting and, and whether it's your lifelong thing or not but you've you practiced that and you've created and so now you it may open things to you later on and just the appreciation of when you see something when you see some giant glass sculpture in Seattle you're like okay I understand how amazingly hard that is to create yeah no all all, all true um. And I think it honestly should be at the same level as uh, reading. And here's why. So reading, you see different parts of your brain are activated when you are reading, especially when you're reading out loud, because it turns on parts of your brain about being imaginative, thinking through the scene that you're describing. Um, you know, so same with being creative. It's turning, it's activating a completely different part of your brain. And it's important for us to have all those different, you know, muscles exercise so that they don't, you know, deteriorate or, you know, even worse, um, become something that we don't look at for, for business solutions. I think it's so critical for any business leader to have some creativity in how they're solving problems. Um, if we're just relying on data sets, I mean, data should inform the decision, but shouldn't make your decision, you know, so you should have a layer of creativity, you should be looking around your industry, you should be, you know, seeing how things are done better. Um, I like this article, um, caught my eye today and I think it was ad week. Um, you know, those big billboards for movies, especially action ones that are coming out and they're kind of like all the same where it's like yeah. the big action hero and like guns blazing and fire. And, you know, right. people are pointing, all right, I want to see Explosions. that. Next the yeah. Well, they did one that's an out of home, but they brought it instead of at the billboard level, um, 
up on a, a freeway. It's down on the walking level. Yeah. And they put behind it um, little, uh, I guess, hoses that now have the people sweating. So you can feel the sweat on the actors on the billboard uh huh. at like the ground level as you're walking by. And my mind was blown. I was like, you take a very tried and true uh, blockbuster approach where they just put the action uh, heroes up on a billboard and then people, you know, see it in the movie theater and they brought it down to ground level. You're walking by it. You touch it and you can feel the sweat. <laughs> what? Oh, you know, but that took yeah. creativity and that took thinking of, through a like, you know, tried and true business problem different. And now they're getting a ton of press and they're getting a ton of shares. People are posting about it on their TikToks and their Instagrams and they're getting, you know, probably 100x the reach for this one billboard. Nobody's going to take a picture of a billboard and, and post that on their TikTok, but they will if they're literally touching the sweat. And yeah, it's just totally different. And so those are the types of things that um, why creativity is important. Hundred percent, and what's great about that too is it, there's a high amount of finesse to that. The, the sweat is like super subtle, right? So it's like they didn't have waterfalls with all the hoses. It was just just enough that it when you to your, when you touched it or even see that little glisten, you're like, oh, man, that's a really realistic poster. And you're like, dear God, it, the poster is sweating. Like this is crazy. Yeah, and to now have a line, you know, around the corner for it. And have it at ground level so people are actually taking videos and then posting it on their own channels. Yeah, Brilliant. it's genius. Brilliant. Now now I just got to figure out what Alassian can do. You know, project management without project management software, it's pretty sweaty. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, I know. It actually did get my wheels turning. Like, how can we pull this in to excite B2B marketing? Because B2B is still B2C at the end of the day. We're all consumers. Yeah. We're all people. Right. Even, you know decision makers for IT, they're still people and they're moved by creative that stands out. Um, so yeah, I agree. Amazing. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on here. I, you have crushed myths better than anyone I can remember of having crushed myths. You're doing a like, great job. I feel like I could talk to you all day. We just scratched the surface on creativity. Um, so I have to have you come back at some point and, and talk more about that. But thank you so much for coming on here. I, from flywheels to to approaches to just picking up on the changes, the, the changes in trust and tech and media consumption. Like, man, so good. So good. This is, this is a gem of an episode of a conversation. And thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. I really enjoyed talking with you too and would love to come back. So thanks Hell for the great yeah. conversation. You bet. Yeah, absolutely. And for those listening, if you learned something, and I freaking know you did because I literally have two pages of notes. I like <laughs> ran out of room. I'm writing in margins over here. Then then definitely share this episode with one person, three people, 9,000. It really doesn't matter. Just get good information into someone else's hands so they can take action on it. And maybe we stop our friends from, you know, friends don't let friends do paid ads until they've looked at community and brand, right? So let's take care of that stuff first. And with that, Sarah, thanks again. Thanks so much, Casey. All right, everyone. This has been another crazy episode of the Hardcore Marketing Show. We will see you all next time.